go ahead and get started, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. This is Social Media 101 for farmers, markets, and food-based businesses. Um, just to kind of go over the objectives for today, we're going to talk about various social media platforms. Um, really, the ones you see on your screen right now, if you can see the screen share, those are the ones we'll be covering um, in depth today, also talking a little bit about the secure security concerns around TikTok. Um, We'll talk a little bit about choosing the right social media marketing platforms for the right job. They're all tools. You don't use a screwdriver to hammer in a nail, you use a hammer. So um, while all of these can be beneficial for your business, they're all used in different ways because they're different tools and you have different outcomes based on how you use them. And then we're gonna talk a little bit about the basics of creating a social media marketing campaign. Really talking about forming um, a goal, looking at how to measure that goal, what you can do to um, kind of plan in advance for social media um, campaigns in the future, because the more you can plan out, the easier it is to run them in, in real time. And um, yeah, that'll be a lot to cover in an hour. So let's jump right into it. Um, let me do a quick little introduction, though. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this because we only have an hour, but my name's Cassandra Clevenger, and I work for Trumbull Neighborhood Partnership. I'm a community um, resource coordinator there, and I am one of many. We have lots and lots of programs. So you can see some of them on the screen. This really um, coincides with the work that we're doing with the Mahoning Valley Farmers Market Network and, and working to connect farmers and markets and, and food vendors and value-added producers together so that we can um, create a more sustainable local food system and, and really create a more, um, I hate to say more because we have such an awesome food system. So I really don't want to kind of poo poo on anything that we're doing, but really just add, add more to it. Be, be more awesome, I guess is a good way of putting it. Um, so let me jump back real quick. A little bit more about me. Like I said, I'm the community resource coordinator at Trumbull Neighborhood partnership. And before I worked at Trumbull Neighborhood Partnership, I worked as an affiliate marketer. I did a lot of social media marketing, blogging, um, things that I didn't go to school for because I um, went to school for science, actually. But um, my side hustle while I worked through college really revolved around social media. And my job now really revolves around social media and staying up to date and current on how to use that as a tool within our organization. So enough about me, let's actually get into the content. Um, let's jump here. Let's start with Facebook, because I think a lot of you are probably already using Facebook. Um, just some notes, some cool facts. It was established in 2004. It's one of the world's most recognizable brands. I think everybody, even if you're not on Facebook, you know what Facebook is. Um, it, its founding was featured in a movie in 2011, um, has over 1 billion users worldwide. There's, that's a seventh of the world is on, a seventh of the people in the world are on Facebook if you, um, if you think all of the profiles are real. Now, that being said, that's something, little side note, all social media, sometimes there's fake profiles and sometimes you have people following you that aren't real people. So there's tools and metrics that you can use and, and ways to engage with folks, but that's something you always have to be mindful of. So there's 1 billion profiles that might not equate to 1 billion people, but if it does, that's a seventh of the world's populations on Facebook. Um, they store approximately 300 petabytes of user data on its servers. Uh, let me see, where are my notes? I can't, a petabyte is huge. I want to say it's like a thousand terabytes. That's more data than any machine has or any computer system could actually process. So when we talk about things costing no money or social media networks being free advertising, nothing's ever free. Your data is what you're using to pay for that service. Um, you don't come out of any money in your pockets. Usually you can start your profiles for free. A lot of people use social media 
but they are collecting user data. That'll come up a little bit later when we talk about TikTok because Facebook is collecting data about its folks when they're using Facebook. Um, Twitter does the same thing, we'll get to that, but Twitter's collecting data about its users when you're using Twitter. TikTok's a little different. Um, Facebook has a lot of features too, Facebook Stories, Facebook Pixel, Facebook Business, Facebook Workplace. They're adding new features almost quarterly, um, honestly, sometimes monthly. The way features roll out on Facebook, um, some people get them at different times. We have two classes coming up soon that you can register for that specifically go into how to use Facebook because it can be so basic and so advanced. So there's a beginner Facebook class and an advanced Facebook class. We talk a little bit about stories and general Facebook marketing and Facebook ads in the um, introductory course, but we'll go into Facebook Pixel and Facebook Business and monitoring your metrics to that next level in the advanced Facebook class. Some of the pros for Facebook, it's the most popular social network, low marketing costs. You can start a business page for $0, but remember they're collecting data. Target audiences by location, demographics, and interests. You can really narrow your focus. If you know who your audience is, you can really work to reach them on Facebook. You can gain insights about your audience when you're using those advanced features, and you can use it to increase your website traffic. You're driving traffic to your website, which might get um, an order. So you're getting that click through is what those are called. You're getting a click through from Facebook into your website where somebody might be able to order your goods and services. Some of the metrics aren't perfect, but they're, they're darn good. Um, when you pay more for an ad buy, it gets seen more. So sometimes smaller fish, just like with any ad advertising, I think if you, it's radio advertising. If you aren't paying top dollar, you're not getting that prime spot. And it's the same thing with Facebook. It changes often. There's a learning curve. There's so many new features being released. And I think with COVID and us shifting more to a social media world and everything that comes with that, I think we're seeing more um, of a change over like, you're seeing investment in those platforms because they're getting used more, so their revenues higher, so there's more in research and development, so there's more coming through in regards to features. So let's jump to Twitter. Twitter's a little different. The primary purpose of Twitter is to connect people and to allow people to share their thoughts with a really large audience. Approximately 350,000 tweets are posted every minute. Um, a lot of people um, know them as the pound symbol, but the hashtag was first introduced to Twitter as a way to um, catalog texts and, and highlight content in 2007. And if you guys didn't know, that little bird has a name and it's Larry. Um, so the pros, all the updates are posted in real time on Twitter. You can send out posts with a greater frequency. It's not odd look, to send out 10 or 15 tweets a day, whereas 10 or 15 Facebook posts might be a lot. Creating 10 or 15 posts sounds like a lot of work, but in Twitter, you're having micro conversations, you're chatting with people, you're, you're looking for that real human connection rather than driving them to your website for a sale, or it's about brand recognition. And you see, I think like a lot of um, screen captures from Twitter are showing up on Facebook where you see these dialogues and conversations happening there and then getting shared as content on other social media platforms. So it's it's something that you can have real, it's almost like a, it, people are using it now almost like a giant messaging app where you have access to brands and people that you've never had access to before. I could go on Twitter right now and tweet directly to um, my local representatives, or I could even go tweet to the president if I wanted to. Now, is it going to answer? Probably not. But having that access at your fingertips, you can get your messages to those folks in ways that you had it before. So using that to build your brand and your business is a really valuable tool. You get a little more privacy since your followers can tweet you without others seeing it. So again, having those genuine relationships with folks. 
And it's a great way to respond to customer complaints and questions because you can, again, have genuine human interaction with folks, which is the best way to um, highlight the awesomeness, word of mouth advertising. It's almost a social media way of being able to do that and to be able to reconcile um, issues that you have that come up in doing business. It's better to do that in a more human way. And we can't necessarily have somebody come to our storefront the same way as we used to. Or, and, and even if we can now, is it going to be like that in the future too, as we move forward, thinking about the world as it is right now? Everything's chronological on Twitter. So in Facebook, I didn't mention this, but content's curated through a logarithm. Facebook has that, like, it's a secret. Nobody knows exactly what it is, but it has to do with a bunch of different metrics and everything gets spit out into your newsfeed. Um, Twitter is completely chronological. So that's why it's not uncommon to see 10 or 15 tweets from somebody because they're trying to reach people throughout their days. You only get 140 characters. There's a lot of spam and a lot of fake users on Twitter. And it requires a lot of vigilance. You need to be keeping up on your Twitter and looking at it. If you want to actually have interaction there, you're, you're using it a lot. Um, it might not be the perfect, if you're not like a social media blogger connected person, it might not be the best platform for you. But if you like to say what's on your mind throughout the day and, and you're okay with that as being part of your business, um, it, it can definitely be a good platform for you. Or if you're just trying to share stories, so sharing stories from your farm, sharing stories from your business, Twitter is a good place to do that too because you can share little blurbs. Um, out in the field picking radishes today, have them at the market on Tuesday, you can send those little blurbs out throughout your day and people feel connected to your business because like number one, they know exactly when this item was made and and they might have talked to you while you were doing it too. So it's a really cool way to way to connect. Jumping into LinkedIn. So I know some people don't think about this for their social media marketing. And it's not necessarily for customers so much as connecting with um, other entrepreneurs, people you might want to business um, establish business partnerships with establish connections and relationships with. So interesting facts about LinkedIn, 41% of millionaires use LinkedIn. And doing research for this, I know about using these, but finding these fun and interesting facts, I thought that one was really, really interesting. It just shows you that a lot of folks that do business and run businesses are on LinkedIn. 59% um, of LinkedIn members have never worked at a company with more than 200 employees. I thought that was really interesting too, because that means that we have small business owners on LinkedIn, um, people that work for small businesses, people that maybe are looking to partner with other small businesses in regards to the products they offer, the services they offer. Um, five and a half million accounts are on LinkedIn. Um, you can highlight your skills and accomplishments. You can, um, others can endorse those skills. It's almost like an online resume and um, it allows users to connect again around those various industries and networks. So if you're looking for some interns, if you're looking for some folks to join on your business, it's a great tool for recruiting talent. Talent. It's really good for staying in the know on industry specific information. So if there is something that you're following, a new technology that you want to introduce to your farm, or you're looking to partner and and or you want to model like another business um, in a similar fashion, you see some what somebody else is doing and you think it would really work for you too. This is a way to get that information to connect with those folks directly. Um, you're not probably gonna generate sales leads for household customers through LinkedIn. I wouldn't spend a lot of time there on that, but having a LinkedIn so people know where you are and what you're doing and people can connect and find you, I think is a great tool. And then again, if you're looking in the future to recruit talent, or bring um, specialized folks in, or you know, just in general, I think LinkedIn's a really great tool for that as well too. So Instagram, I absolutely love Instagram for food. One of my 
earliest green memories around Instagram is really like people posted their food. There was like that huge phenomenon for a while and I, people still do it. Um, during quarantine, how many people were baking bread and sharing photos of their baked bread? I did. I'm raising my hand. I don't have my camera on. I should turn my camera on. You guys should. Sorry about that. It's a little early this morning, but I did. I had, I was baking bread and sharing pictures of it and sharing pictures of food and, and buying and supporting local folks and sharing pictures of that stuff too. So it's a social network. It's a networking service built around sharing photos and videos. It started in 2010. Instagram also has a stories feature and Instagram is also owned by Facebook. So they integrate very nicely. Um, Instagram, your business page and your Facebook business page, those can connect together very well. Um, interesting fact, Instagram was the second most downloaded free app in the Apple App Store. It's currently hiding um, like counts and video views in seven countries. There's a lot of things around online bullying and a couple other um, reasons why they're starting to hide like counts. I bring that up because if they do decide to do that in the United States, it has caused a decrease in um, traffic that folks are seeing on their posts. So it could negatively influence accounts here. Currently, we still can see our likes and um, comment counts, but other, other folks don't. 37% of American adults use Instagram. I see that number rising as more folks, when I hear people talk about Instagram, um, cause I'm nosy and I ask people what social networks they use and stuff. They like to talk about Instagram a lot cause it's escapism. Facebook has become very political. Twitter has become very political not here to talk politics, but if you're looking to escape those conversations and, you, and you're looking for a little bit more entertainment, social media wise in your life, Instagram is where um, some of those folks are fleeing. I do know Instagram is challenging though for those click-throughs, right? So we talked about a click-through is when somebody has a link on your social media or has a link and they click through to your website. Instagram doesn't make it very easy to share links. But when it comes to sharing what you're doing out in the world, doing all of those things, it's fantastic. The filters make taking photos super, super easy. Um, cell phone camera is all you really need to do it. You do not need to be a professional photographer. And those pictures can also be shared and doubled as Facebook content. They, they poured over very, very nicely. Whereas I wouldn't recommend actually sharing your Instagram photos to Twitter. I don't really recommend sharing photos to Twitter in general because they just don't pour it over well in most cases. They have to be a very, very specific resolution to actually pop up in news feeds nicely. So it's a visual platform and food is very, very visual. If your food isn't visually appealing, you're typically not going to want to eat it. Um, so I think Instagram and food just go together like mashed potatoes and gravy or rice and beans or whatever combination, peanut butter and jelly, whatever you're fancy they go together fantastically. It's super easy and intuitive to get started on Instagram. If you like taking pictures and you're already taking pictures as part of your day, you should be on Instagram. I think it's a great way to document what you're doing for your business, what you're doing out on your farm. All super, super awesome. Oh, sorry. Let's go back to that. Great for storytelling and creating customer engagement opportunities for on the farm and off the farm. Instagram also utilizes hashtags for more reach. I definitely always recommend tagging your local city in your Instagram posts, um, your local community, because people will search through those hashtags and they may discover you as a business or a brand through those hashtags. Um, the audience is made up of users primarily 18 to 29. That can be a little bit of a challenge, but keep in mind if people have young children on a platform, there's typically their mothers are on that platform too. Links added to posts don't click through. We talked a little bit about that and you're unable to track click throughs because those links don't click through. You can't tell if the picture you put on your Instagram triggered somebody to want to click through to your website to make a purchase. 
that can be really important when you're trying to drive online sales and trying to increase online sales. And you want to measure if your advertising is actually working to do that. So again, you're really trying to build brand awareness, maybe drive people over to your Facebook page, create content that can be used on both Instagram and Facebook. And it's just another tool to engage folks in a very personalized way. And the pictures are fun to take and the filters are fun. So next we're gonna jump over into YouTube. Interestingly enough, it was founded on February 14th, which is Valentine's Day um, here in the States, in 2005 by three ex PayPal employees. It's a video sharing website. I'm sure most of you guys have used it at some point in time. Um, after its launch, 18 months in, it was bought by uh, Google for 1.65 billion. And the total amount of videos uploaded in 2010 is the equivalent of 150,000 full-length movie movies and theaters every week. That's probably increased substantially even from when that metric was recorded. I love YouTube and I think YouTube's great. This um, presentation is gonna be on YouTube later um, as long as everything goes well when I pull it down from the recording. But it does take a little bit of um, time, money. There's a production quality that has to be a part of your videos to really get those views and to really, really reach your audience. So I think it's great to interact with customers in a genuine way. It's a great opportunity to um, teach customers, sorry, that says each, but it's supposed to be to teach customers how to use or care for your products or new skills that will make them buy your product. So if you're selling a tool or you're selling a type of food, if you're doing cooking videos because you're selling different things on sale that week, it's a great way to drive people to do that. But again, if you're putting together a cooking video, that's a little bit intensive, right? It's, there's a little bit of technical expertise required to that. You gotta get your kitchen all clean and tidy before you do it. I feel like that even takes sometimes upwards of an hour just to get ready for filming and then you have to get everything together. It can, it can take a lot. And then you're trying to hold the camera and you're trying to stir and do all the things and, it, and it's very, very time intensive. So um, just keeping that in mind. But we have these wonderful tools now, these cell phones. These take really high quality video. So if you are out and somebody is with you and you can do those kind of videos real quick and put something together, I highly, highly recommend it, but it might not be the best thing for sales, pushing sales. Again, you're using it more to um, build brand awareness. I think if you're trying to target local folks and you're using videos, it would still be better to use Facebook because you're gonna get more of an international audience or at least a national audience on YouTube, which can be beneficial too, but I mean, when you're, thinking about the time you're spending on your social media and the returns that you're getting on your social media when you're creating your social media plans. That's, that's very, that's something you really, 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 really want to consider what's going to give you the biggest bang for your buck. YouTube editing software is clunky. I would recommend if you are using video or YouTube, have your video completely and totally edited in an outside software. There are free versions available. If it's something you're interested, I would be more than happy to provide more information. There's also paid versions. I highly recommend the paid versions if you can afford them, but they are pricey. There are a lot of trolls on YouTube. You really have to have a thick skin before you start going into that. And I would say that for most social media, letting things roll down your back, maybe having somebody that's not so connected to your business working to help you um, moderate your accounts if you're having a problem with trolls coming in or something like that. But there are people in the world whose main goal in life, because for whatever reason, is to make other people miserable online. And the longer you're online, the higher chances are that you will run into those folks. So um, just being prepared for that, knowing what your plan is to deal with that, all of the above, I really highly recommend that. And that goes for all of them, but really for YouTube because it can get really ugly. So let's talk about TikTok. 
TikTok is all the news right now, right? So there's a few countries that have banned the use of TikTok. Um, but before we get to that, I'm going to read what I had prepared for you guys before um, the security scandal broke um, to the degree that it did. So it's right in 2019, it was the fourth most popular free app downloaded in the iPhone app store. 800 million active users worldwide from 154 countries. A quarter of them are 18 to 24. I thought this was an interesting thing to note. They're typically wealthy. 37% of US TikTok users report household income of more than 100,000. And some countries have been considered placing a ban on the program, which more and more are, including the United States. So it's new, it's less developed. The influencers there are younger. Many times they're in the teen and preteen demographic. It's really about memeing, so I think a lot of people think TikTok and think dance videos, but sometimes there's the whole duets where there's two people and they're lip syncing. There are a lot of, and then they repeat themselves. There's challenges, there's memes. There's a lot of people duplicating content. So um, for example, if all social or all security concerns aside, if you were to use TikTok for your business, one idea would become, would ugh, I'm scrambling my words. Let me stop for a second. One idea would to make a creative and funny video um, about your business where you're doing something kind of fun. Think maybe the ice bucket challenge or um, a funny song or something creative that your kids came up with or something, a fun dance that you did on the farm. Um, it would be, the goal would be to have other people copy that have other people do that and to reference your main video to get that viral, to get that shared, to increase your reach. That being said, I do not recommend anyone to have this software on any of their devices. If you currently have it on your devices, I would remove it. If your children currently have it on their devices, I, will remove, I would remove it. I would have them remove it and delete their accounts. We talked about data in the beginning of the presentation about specifically social media, um, different types of platforms. Facebook's collecting data about Facebook. Twitter's collecting data while users are using Twitter about Twitter. TikTok is collecting everything. It is pulling what your private text messages say. It is pulling information from other apps. It is pulling all of your information you've put on your phone's clipboard. It is hardcore spyware. It is in your everything right now, if you have it on your phone. The US and the UK have really strict laws on how companies must handle data. Now there was a whole debacle with Facebook and um, Cam Cambridge Analytica, and a, they, they got in trouble. There's a lot of contention around sharing data online and what you share and how much data is available. And I just want everyone that's considering social media and integrating social media into their life or their business to be aware of this data. And TikTok, I, at this time, unless they do some updates to fix some of these security breaches and put some walls in place so they can't look at everything on your device, I would not consider them in any way, shape, or form. They just recently released an ad um, platform on there, or an ad, what's the word for it? An ad option on their platform. And I would not recommend using that either. I would not recommend giving them any of your financial information. I would get them off your phone ASAP. I cannot stress that enough. Okay, so we covered a lot, right? We're about a half an hour into this and we've um, talked about all of these different um, possibilities for social media marketing. And, and really, this is only scratching the surface. There's even more. Um, 
Snapchat's a big one. Um, I really wouldn't recommend that one for business advertising at this time. Um, trying to think of some other ones. Oh, my mind is drawing a blank right now. There are a lot of smaller social media networks. I also wouldn't really so much recommend them unless you're trying to hit a national audience. Um, networks, um, excuse me, now I'm thinking of them. Reddit, um, Discord, um, Slack in some ways, but that's more for workplace management. I, I, I really wouldn't recommend these ones for marketing. These, the ones I've listed here are the ones that I think are most useful for, for businesses. But if you have any questions about any other ones, please let me know. Okay, so again, what does this all mean? A little breakdown of a chart. I'll send this out in the notes too, if you guys can't see it. But um, just some general user information, a summary of the purpose, what the best use is, and some of the limitations of that software. So when you're thinking about what you want to use software-wise and where you want to invest your time the most, you want to think about your audience. Who's your audience and who's your customer base? Who are the folks you want to reach? Who are the folks currently buying your products? Who are the folks you want to see buying your products in the future? Thinking about that growth. Where are they? Where do they spend most of their time? We all spend time online now. I'd say probably a good 90% of the people in the world in some way probably spend time online in some way, whether that's interacting with their grandchildren through some photos or, or full-blown social media influencer. That's how they make their living. That's how they do their work. They're a contractor and they're doing work with brands and doing marketing and affiliate marketing. Um, so thinking about everybody's online, right? So where is your demographic, your audience spending most of their time online? What are your goals? Is your goal to get more people knowledgeable about local foods and, and the services you're providing as a business? Are you trying to tell your story more? Are you trying to build brand engagement? Are you trying to drive sales? Really taking some time to spell out what those goals are, are really important. So we just got a question in the chat. Can you advise how we work out the best times of the week and the times of the day to maximize customer engagement? That's a great question. That's something you want to consider and every social media platform is different. When I start thinking about that though, I try to think about the times that I would use social media and I start there. So I like to use social media when I first get up in the morning. I check my Facebook, I check my Twitter. I might check Instagram, but I'm not a real big Instagram user. Facebook is my bread and butter. That's where I spend the most of my digital time. Um, so I will spend like an hour on Facebook in the morning, just scrolling through Facebook between the hours of, I would say 6 a.m. Eastern time and 9 a.m. Eastern time. I find that it's also good to catch people around their lunch break or maybe in the afternoon lull when they're at the office and they're stuck and that's when we tend to um, scroll a little bit. Oh no, this is a great question. I'm glad you answered it or you asked it. I'm glad I can answer it. Let me know if I, I, I hit the nail on the head. I also like to look at my Facebook after dinner. So in, in planning my advertising campaign, if I was completely new to this and had no clue when my people were online, I would start with those times with some posts and I might scatter some posts at some other times too. But the great thing about Facebook and why I am like a Facebook like I'm on my soapbox about Facebook is I can go back and see which posts got the most engagement. And sometimes with Facebook, it's not even about time because that logarithm allows people to see that content later. But if you can catch people on that first go around, it is best. Twitter, I, I really just space them out throughout the day. So you have the most chance of catching folks. If you have a lot of things to say that day, maybe you, you plan them out in the morning and write them down in a notebook and, and then space them out. Um, YouTube, I would post the content whenever you have the content available. Um, if you have a big following, you can set premiere times. 
but I would say it's best not to, if you're doing any videos or live streaming, try not to compete with how other people spend their entertainment time. So like, I'm not going to try to um, compete with primetime TV on a Wednesday night, maybe at eight or nine o'clock in the evening. I might try to do my video stream at two o'clock in the afternoon. Um, does that help answer the question a little bit? I hope it does. But planning those times out, it's really about experimenting and then not just experimenting and shooting in the dark, but coming back and looking at your metrics and which posts got the most likes and the most shares and, and help drive followers to your site and all of those kind of things. Yes, social media engagement is typically poor on the weekends because a lot of people don't have as much time to dedicate to their digital life. They're doing things with their families, they're off of work, whereas sometimes social media is an escape from those more mundane aspects of the nine to five life Monday through Friday. I like to post social media first thing on Monday because it's like people have a hard time getting moving and stuff, but um, it really, after you've posted it a couple different times on your platform and you can look at your metrics and see even just how many people liked something compared to um, different times of the day, how many people viewed the post, you can kind of get a, a gauge for when your audience is online. Okay, so social media use. This is the percent of adults who use at least one social media site. You can see in 2006, it was very, very low. It was less than 20%. And now again, this is US adults. Almost 80% of US adults are using at least one social media site. Yes, I will send out some video editing apps along with the um, presentation today. Let me make sure I write that down so I don't forget. If you um, have Windows, the one big one, it's Windows Movie Player. It's very basic, but it's also pretty intuitive. But I will um, send over some more too. If you have a little bit of money to spend, I also like Spark Video. And that's an Adobe product. It's pretty awesome. And then I also like Canva. If you have a little bit of money to spend for Canva, if you can afford like the monthly plan, the the graphics you can make with that program, the access to elements you have for graphics. Um, even if you can't do it, if you have somebody in your family that's pretty savvy with a the computer, they don't have to be a graphic designer. It could be um, a niece or a nephew, a child, a grandson, grandchild, any, anything really, anybody really, not anything, anybody really can, can help you um, work if you have with Canva. It is super, super, super intuitive. Um, so thinking about the, I'm not going to spend too much time here, but let me go ahead and jump to time spent since we talked a little bit there. So if we talk about daily on Facebook, this is the among the users of each social media site, the percentage who use that site with the following frequencies. Most people are checking their social media daily. If not, they're checking it weekly. A few people less often, but those percentages are really small as compared to other folks. And these are surveys done through Pew Research um, in 2019. When we talk about platforms too, this is a wonderful breakdown and I'll send out a link to this presentation too so you can see these up close. But again, when you're looking at the percentage of adults who are using Facebook, that's really, high among most age demographics. Most age demographics, it's over 75%. A lot of women are using Facebook, but even a high percent of men are using it. Um, with Facebook, you see, or with Instagram, sorry, you definitely see an increase more with women compared to men. And that 18 to 29 category is really high for Instagram. Um, but I know that's one of our challenges, right? We're always talking about how, um, well, I know at least around our farmer's market, how do we get more youth in there? How do we get those 18 to 30 year olds at the market? So maybe, maybe, maybe I need to start using Instagram more and I need to consider Instagram as more of a platform for my market because I'm spending a lot of time on Facebook and I can see that actually through 
my um through what I'm getting from my metrics demographic wise, physically shopping at the Warren Farmers Market every week. So these are all breakdowns, but for the sake of time, I really want to get into um, some of our other content. So bear with me while I go back a couple slides here. Head back to our main one. So I want to talk a little bit about social media campaigns. Really, it can be done in five steps, but you can make these steps as complicated or as easy as you'd like to. So um, really sitting down with a piece of scratch paper or, or your notebook or however you like to sit down and start brainstorming and thinking about ideas for your business. I know everybody has their own process. Um, it really starts with identifying your target audience and your campaign goals. So I would really start, like if I was doing this for myself, I would, I would sit down and I would have two columns who are my current customers, because you want to increase sales there, and who are my, who do I want to see as my customers? Who would I like to target more? And really setting some goals around that. Um, when I say goals, I mean, this starts getting into tracking things a little bit. And we can definitely talk on a, um, after this, I, I, I'm more than happy to meet with anybody who's attending this webinar right now to talk about what this would mean specifically for your business, because to go into every scenario would be difficult. But when I say making some goals, I mean, through your social media campaign, you want to see a 10% increase in sales on this item, or you want to see this much more traffic at this market or really hammering out some goals that you can look back onto and measure in some way. You never wanna create things that are complex and more cumbersome for your business when you're thinking about this. So there's certain things that you're probably already tracking. I hope sales is one of them because if you are a business, you wanna make sure that you know how much you paid in supplies versus how much you received in sales. and and try to figure out what your net profits are. If you're, if you're collecting that at the very least and you're collecting it for each sales um, week or each market or however you're collecting it, there's going to be a way to integrate your social media campaigns to make sure that you're seeing an increase in sales. An increase in sales might not be what you're trying to do though. I think in the end, it's what we're all trying to do, but your primary campaign goal might be a brand awareness campaign. In which case, that would be a little trickier to measure. Maybe you're asking folks and you're asking every person that you see at the market, have you heard about us before? Or you're putting in a um, customer survey card in every bag and asking folks to do a survey and then they get a little free gift from you or a discount from you for completing that survey so you can find out about their brand awareness, how much they know about your brand, um, how, how much they know about your process and what you do as a business, which I think is really, really, again, food is so personal. Everybody eats. We all eat differently. Food is connected to our cultures and our identity. It's all very, 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 very personal. And it's all very, very connected. And it connects us on larger scales. So I think even just knowing where your food comes from and how your food was grown. And does somebody know about your growing processes and techniques? Because not only are you knowing if your campaign worked, but you're also identifying more areas for future campaigns, future goals, lots and lots of opportunities. So from there, you would determine if the platforms you're using are delivering the campaign. That would be, you know, that's why you set the goal. So you can go back and measure against the goals to see if the goals are accomplishing or if you're accomplishing the goals, I should say, shoot for the moon. It's okay not to reach your goals. You want to measure growth. You want to push yourself to be in the place you want to be with your business overall. So if you're always shooting small, you're going to end up arriving small. But if you're shooting for the moon and you're always pushing and you're pushing for that top, that top where you want to be as a business, you're going to reach that a lot easier than if you're, you, it's always going to be incremental. You're not always going to hit the mark, but you should always be striving to hit it and go above it. 
if you're hitting every single goal all the time, you are not pushing yourself hard enough. You'll develop content and engagement strategies for each platform. You'll have goals for each platform. That's why you're determining the platforms for delivering the campaign, because I might not put every campaign on every um, platform. I might do a campaign to drive online sales to my online store so um, I can have people just pick up their products directly at the market. I can measure that through Facebook. I would use Facebook to deliver that. I might mention it a few times on Twitter, but that wouldn't be my primary driver. I would be working to add that as maybe one of my posts every couple days while still working heavily to interact with my brand um, and my folks and my customers on Twitter. I, I wouldn't probably create any con content for YouTube unless I was showing somebody how they can order online. So maybe I did do that and I did a quick little demo video on how to use my online store. But if I didn't have something like that in place where I could do that, I would probably mix um, YouTube completely. And where on Instagram, I would just be trying to push photos of all of the awesomeness that people can order on my online store and mention that I have an online store and just really pushing awareness of that. So you'll have strategies for each platform and ways you measure for each platform. Um, from that, you create the strategy and you evaluate the strategy and optimize. So that's why you have goals. So you can go back and see if you met those goals. If you didn't meet those goals, how can you meet them in the future? Um, if you did meet your goals, what worked? How did you meet your goals? How do you do more of that? Was it a fly by night thing? Was it the this aligned and that aligned and everything worked? Or did you hit the target on, like, did you hit the target on something else with that post? Humor's great. If people can kind of chuckle a little bit right now, that's awesome. We had um, the Warren Farmers Market Manager, who's also on this call right now, she made a post for our Facebook page and it blew up and it was so cute. It just said, don't get distracted. The market's coming up and it had, or it said, oh, look, a squirrel. Don't get distracted. The market's Tuesday at Perkins Park. And it had a little picture of a squirrel and a list of all of our vendors. And that post got so much reach because it was just a cute little thing. And it just hit our audience and it flew. So knowing that that worked, trying to create more things like that, pushing more in that direction, you kind of get a feeling for what your folks like. And that's why some of the other platforms are really helpful too, because you really just get to know people. Social media can feel so distant. You can feel so detached, but when you really use it to truly engage with folks and, and do authentic, transparent engagement, it can be super, super, super beneficial for building long-term relationships. So. That's campaigning in a nutshell. We'll talk a little bit more specifically about campaigning on Instagram and what that would look like and Facebook and um, Twitter. As we move forward throughout the year, we'll be doing these workshops every single month. But those are the five basic steps. If you outline and take a little bit of thought, it can be as complex and this could be like a 25 page plan or it could really just be your notes and thoughts and scribbles down on a piece of paper that you tuck away and pull back out later at a later date. It does not have to be super complex, but just taking some time and thought to consider what do I want to do with my social media? And that'll help guide your posts. That'll help guide your outreach. That'll help guide because you'll start seeing more of like, oh, I can do this to make that happen, or I can do this to make that happen. And it'll start giving you more ideas for content too. So lastly, and I'm really excited because I finished on time here. We're gonna jump to building building a brand with stories. So um, let me pull up my notes on this one. Oops. Okay, sorry. I also have a planning sheet for um, social media campaign planning. I didn't go through it because it's pretty much the previous um, bit broken down into little sections, but I will share a copy of this with you guys 
And you'll also get a copy of this as a quick reference sheet too, that you'll be able to use. So jumping over to brands and storing, storytelling, um, your brand's gonna establish your unique identity for customers. Yes, you're growing fruits and vegetables, but what makes you special? What makes your farm special? Yes, you're serving this type of food, but what, what exactly sets you apart from everybody else? Every business has a story, every single one. When you think of Nike, you might not think of individual products Nike sells, but you know of Nike as a brand. It means something. Some of the things it might mean to you are quality. Um, you know you're getting this product. You know what what you know Nike sells sports sporting goods automatically. You know all of these different things from that brand. Um, there's a lot of brands out there like that, right? Um, Apple is a very specific one. When you buy an Apple product, you know what you're getting into. Um, there's a level of tech that you're purchasing. There's a level of quality that you're purchasing. Now, not always the case. I don't want us to get us confused with what a brand's been built up and established to be and what you might actually get as a product. It's kind of the point, right? The brand is this wonderful, amazing legacy story. It's the brand. I, I can't, I, I'm trying, I'm, I'm, at a loss of words of how else I can describe it because it doesn't always match up with the customer experience. You want it to though, and your brand is very, 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 very important, particularly when you're just establishing it. If Apple would have made inferior product, uh, some would argue that Apple makes inferior products now. If that argument was as strong when Apple started, I don't think that it would be the brand that it is today. So making sure that, you know, all of those things, you have a quality product and a quality brand are very, very, very important to a small business. So I'm kind of rambling a little bit, but it's thinking about your brand. One of the ways to do it for food based businesses and farms is to tell your story. Some folks are multiple generation farm owners, multiple generation cooks. They're using their great aunt's recipe to make this item and selling it to folks now, or it's their um, grandmother's secret sauce recipe. These are all wonderful stories and that's what people wanna, wanna buy, right? So um, thinking about it in relation to your story and your mission, what's your goals as a business? We all wanna make money, but what is your business doing beyond that? What good services are you providing? What are the benefits of using your product over other products? Those are all part of your story, right? So thinking about your values, these are some questions that you might want to answer when thinking about um, thinking about your farm story. Are your values, what's your farm's personality or your business's personality? You can substitute farm for business, definitely. Um, what do you do best as a business, as a farmer, and what need are you fulfilling to your customers? These all help build that brand. So Nike's filling that need for athletic goods. Apple is filling that need for tech. What need is your business filling? Apple has this personality where it's kind of quirky and fun and for young people. Um, thinking, what is your personality. Um, what is your best product as a business? If you know you grow the best sweet corn, you have the freshest product because of the processing you're using, um, which I, we had a question come through in the chat. What's your suggestion for a new startup with frozen product business and which platform is preferred? I would heavily suggest really like thinking about um, where those products are being sold and teaming up on the social media where those businesses are already promoting those products and really thinking about these kind of things to build your brand because frozen products, there's a lot of frozen products out on the market. So what separates you from this guy, from that gal, from this person, from that folk? 
what what's the difference between you and all of them in your business and really pushing to share that with where the folks that you want to reach as a business are congregating whatever social media network that may be so there's a really cool book about um telling farm stories called made to stick and they state that there's five things you must do to ensure your story sticks with customers. Simplicity, unexpectedness, concrete, credible, and emotional. You wanna pull on the heartstrings. You wanna make sure that what you're telling is true and if people fact check you, that they're gonna come up with the same facts in which you told the story because that's your reputation and that's extremely important. Concrete kind of goes with that credible. It needs to be believable and um, what's the word I'm looking for? People need to be able to, un it can't be super abstract. It has to have a beginning, middle and end. It can't like be all flowy and you end up over here and you end up over here. It's just gotta be boom, boom, boom. An unexpected twist, everybody loves a twist. Uh, that's why certain genres of movies have been popular forever and will probably continue to be popular because you just don't expect um, the story to happen. So thinking about obstacles you face and sharing those, it's always challenging because you, some of us are very outgoing and extroverted. And some of us are very introverted and, and keep to ourselves a little bit more. So how much are you willing to share about your struggles and your triumphs, really? What are you okay with the public knowing? What are you okay with everybody knowing? Those are the things you have to consider when you're thinking about your business story. But the more honest you can be, the more, um, the stronger the foundation that you'll build with your customers because they'll be there with you to celebrate your triumphs. And if you've connected with them right, they'll be there with you to mourn through the downfalls. They'll, they'll be there to support you through thick and thin because they're connected to you. They're bought into what you're doing as an organization, what you're doing as a business. So um, I would probably start, the story shapes your reason for existence. Why does your business exist? Why did you decide to start doing this? Again, food is so personal. So there, I, I know with every single one of your businesses, I, I don't even know most of you, and I know with your businesses, there's something personal there to pull out. Um, we're all here to make money. Nobody cares about that part. <laughs> What is the reason? If it's because you want to provide good food to your community, that's awesome. That's a great starting point. Run with that. If it's because you saw a gap that needed to be filled, run with it. If it's whatever it is, there's a reason beyond just you had a dream at some point to start your business. So share that dream with folks. Get them excited about it. So I just want to leave because we're about 11.03. We'll be wrapped up right at 11.05 and I'll have some more time for questions in the chat. But social media is a tool. Um, and right now with COVID-19 and everything that's happening in the world, it's been really, really, really hard for us to react or to interact genuinely with one another. Um, lockdowns, being stuck in your house, working from home, even doing this workshop. I had planned on doing this online and in person, and it's really sad that I don't get to see some of your faces in person um, due to all of this. But I think social media, when used as a tool and you're genuinely connecting with people, you're not just posting and forgetting about it, um, post and run. You're not just um, ignoring when people interact with your content and you're replying to it and you're following up with them. And, and I would highly recommend getting rid of the auto messages on your Facebook mes messenger, any auto messages you have generating to customers because you should be reaching out to them personally and treating them in the same way as you would if they stopped by your store or they stopped by your farm stand, you know, asking people how they're doing. Um, just 
interacting with folks beyond just, I know we get stuck in the text message world where it's like, bing, boom, bing, boom, bing, boom, but just taking a second to have a genuine human interaction, even though social media is the tool that we're having it right now. I think that's the biggest takeaway. And you could honestly probably not do much wrong if you were doing at least that with your social media accounts. So that being said, it is 11.05. We've been at it for an hour. Does anybody have any other questions that they wanted to ask in the chat? Oh, thank you so much. Glad to see uh, some folks. I, I was really excited to see that uh, some people were able to join that I would have never gotten a chance to meet or talk to businesses and such. So thank you so much for joining us. I really appreciate it. Well, if we don't have any other questions, thank you so much for joining us today. And definitely check out our Eventbrite, uh, excuse me, Eventbrite page where you um, registered for this event because we will definitely have some events coming up in the future too. So thank you so much, everyone, and have a wonderful day. We'll try to get as long as everything, I, I really hope everything goes well with my recording right now because we'll get this up online and everything too. So thanks and have a wonderful day.